and Pharisees, hypocrites all, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. You do not go in yourselves, nor do you let others enter. Blind guides! Serpents, brood of vipers, how can any of you escape damnation? from God or anywhere in the Torah. Absolutely. One, I want one Absolutely. verse. One verse. The book of Deuteronomy, Moses commands the Jewish people that you must go to the judges in that time to interpret all of Scripture. And that's because the written Bible is so utterly the, ambiguous. That's why there's 500 denominations of Christianity. So it didn't they come have no Moses, oral law, so they, but can't agree, no, they can't agree on how no, to interpret it. Still wasn't well, well I'll, I'll give you an example. That's still I'll not give you an my example. Question. Before Jesus dies, he says to Peter, here's the keys to heaven. Catholics say that means he made him the Pope. Rabbi Protestants Snorri. say it means Sure. You're a nice guy, Peter. Let, let me jump I, in and I, say I, tell me, Tell me where it is. Do you know where it says in the Tanakh? Well, for, uh, the verse that Shmuel was talking about is Deuteronomy 17. It says to go to the priest, Levitical priest or judge in, in that day. But it's just talking about having a Supreme Court in the nation with certain difficult legal cases. You have a court system. That's all, that's all it's talking about. And this was the highest court in the okay, land. Okay, I understood so, that. So, so, I, know, I want to know where it I'm says I'm amazed it. that you're saying that when you know that Jesus was a Pharisee who studied the oral law, and that's why Jesus quotes the oral law. I'll give you an example. When Jesus picks corn on the Sabbath, and he's criticized for it with, with his students, he defends it by saying the Sabbath was not given for, man was not given for the Sabbath, the Sabbath was given for man. That's straight from the Talmud. But hang on. Jesus what, what studied the Talmud. Hang he on. was a Pharisaic rabbi. Most of his writings of his Hebrew identity and make him into a Christian. That's why he says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 18, that anyone who doesn't keep the last little letter of every law of the Torah will be the least in the kingdom of heaven. Now, what did Jesus mean when he said the last of the letter? Why didn't he say all the laws? He meant every last interpretation that the rabbis, the Pharisees, of which he was a part, had mandated, had legislated. In point of fact, although there were certain things Jesus did in harmony with the oral law, for example, the existence of synagogues and things like that, and certain traditions that seemed his disciples followed, there are things very clearly they did not follow. For example, Matthew 15 and Mark 7, they didn't follow the tradition of the washing of the hands, which becomes one of the key seven rabbinic commandments. And he says that by your traditions, you're making void the word of God. He had certain mm. things in common with the Pharisees, but he transcended any one particular group. Here, here's That's what happened. The times you, the temple, you, you, it you, was the priests that washed their hands. And the reason we wash our hands today is so that the priests, now that there's no temple, won't forget. It's an act of solidarity. But it was one that of the non -priests, the elders No, no, no. no that that's, that's incorrect. It. The, the real, as you know, Mike, the real reason we wash hands is that the priests are commanded to, at that time there were priests because they, there was a temple. The point is that Jesus never acts in contravention to Jewish law, and when he does, he always justifies it. Why didn't he tell how, those how who criticized him? He quoted from the Talmud, though, what, the Sabbath's made for man, not, uh, not man for the Sabbath. It's from the Talmudic source. Oh, but the Talmudic source comes after. The earliest no, example we have true. of it is the Makota, which, which postdates the Mishnah, New Testament. It's Mishnah, after that. Mishnah is well before Jesus. Mishnah is compiled fact, by Rabbi Yudhana C. In, in the second, end of the second century. Hillel died. Hillel was one of the main authorities of the Mishnah. Yeah. Died a hundred years before, he's before Jesus. Quoted, ever, he's not the Hillel? Mishnah. Hillel is one of the most important authorities. I'm amazed that you would say that. There's the the House of Hillel is one of the most central most authorities of the, of the mission. Named are before the, the end comes, he says these things are going to happen while you guys are still alive. So this expectation is really there. And at the moment, nothing from Judaism has yet been violated. To summarize, Jesus is a Jewish person, a Jewish rabbi, I would actually call him a Pharisee. Jesus was a Pharisee. All his followers were Pharisees. They were all Torah observant. They all kept the law. And they believed that he was the Messiah, he was crucified. They believed he was coming back. One of the points that I've made in previous shows is that the earliest Christians all knew this very, very clearly. That the oral, that the, if you want to know what the truth is in terms of knowledge of Torah, that the oracles are from the Jews. Go to the Jews, they know it. It says it openly. And it's not the Sadducees ever in the Christian Bible. It's only, only the Pharisees. You see, as I mentioned in Matthew 23, 1 and 2. And this is, these are not complementary chapters. But the key in the Christian text is that the Jews have the truth in terms of their knowledge. 
And in fact, Paul says this openly, uh, the book of Romans is no doubt the most important book that was written by Paul, and it is of the seven letters of Paul that are certainly from his hand. Romans will be the last of them, and Romans is unique in that he's writing to an audience he hasn't met yet. He has not been to Rome yet. But Paul says in chapter th Romans chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, is there any benefit to being a Jew? Is there any profit to being... Is there, what is unique about the Jewish people? And then if you go to Romans chapter 3, verse 2, the next verse says, it's there, what is very special about the Jewish people is that the oracles were given to them. That means there was no question to the early... If you would say to the earliest Christians of the, of the first century that there was no oral law, they would look at you like you, you'd say, like the Holocaust number, they'd say, what are you, nuts? That means you're a Sadducee. That means you're whacked out. You're completely off the rails. The earliest uh, Christians knew there was an oral Torah. Of course they knew there was an oral Torah. It, however, later on, the church would come to reject the oral Torah, and the, there was a number of factors, but the key point is that because the oral Torah it is conveyed from a master, from a teacher, to a disciple, and it was conveyed from the Jewish people, from, from rabbi to student, and because the church would become um, uh, vociferously opposed to the Jewish people, and we see this manifested very early on. We have church fathers in second century really writing the most horrible things about the Jews. Um, we have Melito. I mean, we actually dug up their writings. I mean, horrific things about the Jews. Uh, Justin said terrible things about the Jews. Tertullian wrote a whole book against the Jews. This is, these are very, very early church fathers. So what was happening was in the earliest church, they were, when I say the earliest, I want to change that. In the second century church, when they were celebrating Easter, there was no celebrating of Easter in the first century uh, in any surviving writings. Uh, Easter was a Christian holiday from what we know from the second century. There's nowhere in the Christian Bible that people are celebrating Easter, but clearly in the second century. So they were celebrating Easter based on when the Jews said it was Passover. But the entire Jewish calendar is based on the Oral Torah. And, and what was happening was is that the Christians had to ask the Jews, when is Passover? In order for them to know when to celebrate Easter. In fact, in Indonesia, in, in, in the Indonesian language, uh, the name for Easter is Pascha. I'm pretty sure I pronounced that correctly. In many different languages, in Slavic languages, the name for Easter is not Easter, but it's Pascha, it means Pesach. So the Christians would be celebrating Passover when the Jews told them it was Passover. The point is that our Jewish calendar is based on the oral Torah of the Jewish people. And the early Christians all based their when they celebrate Easter, based on when the Jews in our oral Torah said it's uh, Passover. That's who they went to. They didn't, <laughs> that's what they did. What happened was that the church became more viciously anti Jewish, and it became later church fathers began going, This is really disgusting that we should have to go to the Jews to. Um, to, we should know when to celebrate our holiday. So there became a movement. Now this was a major fight in the church that 99% of Christians know nothing about. But in the early church, this was such a fight that, the, that there were many church fathers who thought that the whole Christianity would just completely explode. And this was resolved in, in, at, at Nicaea under Constantine. And Constantine wrote a letter which he curses the Jews. And he says it's disgusting that we should ever look to the Jews to know when, uh, when to assign our most holy date. We should go to these filthy Jews who are the enemies of God and the enemies of the church who killed Jesus. We should go to them. So therefore what happened was the church began to hate the oral Torah and despise it and to curse it 
And now the Messianic movement and all these other Christian denominations all reject the oral Torah. Incidentally, you could not even read the Bible without an oral Torah because I know for many people this is a shock if you're learning Hebrew, but when you learn Hebrew, what makes it easy for you to read is you have the letters, the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, but the vowels you see underneath the letters, those vowels you see, those vowels, the written system of those vowels are um, uh, were, were, were created maybe 1,200 years ago. That means prior to, let's say, if we went back to the 5th century, no one would know what these vowels were. It was always orally transmitted. What happened was they were Mesorites. These were rabbis in the 8th and 9th century uh, that created a written system to record what was until then only known orally. You have to understand the full force of what I just said. The Torah, all of Tanakh, has in your printed Bibles little dots and lines under the letters that tell you what do these vowels do. It's just the same thing in Hebrew. So all the vowels that you see, if you look in actually a Torah scroll, so you know everything I'm saying to you, if you look inside a scroll, any scroll on parchment in the world, there's no vowels. Why aren't there vowels in a scroll, in an actual parchment scroll? The reason is because it's those vowels that you see, those uh, points, what are called nekudot, which are those uh, uh, lines, those, those, uh, those markings, were invented. There's nothing wrong with it. If it's in a printed Bible, in a printed Hebrew Bible, you can do that, but you're not allowed to put that inside of a Torah scroll because the only thing that goes in a Torah scroll is what was given to us by God for Moses. And those, the, all the vowels were only known to us orally. And if you want to be sure that every word I'm saying to you is true, it's only no Christian would disagree with what I'm, I mean, no Christian has any, even a perfunctory knowledge of the Hebrew language would disagree with me. That's why if you look at the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is now available to anyone online, anyone online, any, well, you can go online, look at Dead Sea Scrolls, you'll never see a vowel. So what did people do 2,000 years ago? That was oral Torah. That means that was oral information. What vowel went under each, what letters? And if you change the vowels around, you change the meaning around. Does it say, don't, does it say, don't boil a kid in its mother's milk? Or does it say, which would mean fat? It's the same, the consonants are the same. I could switch around the, I could switch around the, the vowels and I could change the whole meaning of the word. We wouldn't understand when the Bible says in Leviticus 3, don't eat any fat. What fat are they talking about? You wouldn't know without the oral Torah. So this is, now, one of the things that, when I began to study the Christian literature, because I felt a, I felt a calling to help Jews who were in the church return back to the, the faith of Israel, obviously it became very clear to me that, uh, that I would have to uh, study the New Testament. It was, it, was a, it, was, it was something that I went to with, with hesitation, but I knew it was absolutely necessary because I knew that in order for me to be able to speak to a Christian in terms of the Christian I understand, I would have to read a Christian Bible. But I grew up in a very traditional Jewish home. No one read Christian Bibles. I never, I mean, growing up, I never even saw a New Testament. I, mean, I never even saw the, a Christian, I mean, unless I, someone happened to have it on a train, on the D train, and I just didn't notice it. But I didn't, so it was really, I thought reading, when I would read the Christian Bible, because I wanted to help, Jews who had uh, converted to Christianity, became Messianic, joined Jews for Jesus. I didn't know exactly what I'd find, and I, but I was pretty sure that what I would count would be unfamiliar to me, would be very strange, would be alien. And, but I knew that I had to study it very carefully and I had to understand it so that I can help my, help my brethren and one of the things that really shocked me was when I began to read uh, the Christian canonical literature was that I saw that the Christian Bible was repeatedly using um, oral, uh, the maxims, 
the language, even the thinking, even the logic that is only found in the or, that is found in the oral Torah. And in fact, you find in the Gospels the storytelling, which is why the Gospels are are so uh, gripping for Christians, is that they tell basically are telling stories, and Christians have, find those stories very very compelling. But in fact, what I was stunned that the Christian Bible, there was the the oral Torah was being used to make points. But if you now, notice the argument that Jesus is using with the interlocutors, as is portrayed in the Gospels, it's only understandable from the oral law. I'll give you an example. When Jesus is healing someone in John chapter seven, verse uh, 20, 20, 21, 22. So he is attacked right away. You're healing someone on the Sabbath. How are you allowed to heal someone on the Sabbath? You can heal anybody you want on Shabbos. What is he violating? Incidentally, if he's violating something, that's a proof that there is an oral law. I mean, you see how this actually explodes on itself. If there were a prohibition to heal someone on Shabbos, which would... Uh, which would, would Pharisees would object to, where did they get that from? The answer is they got it from nowhere. But it's the story that makes people read and go, boy, those Jews are really the enemies of God. So, so what happens is the Pharisees attack Jesus and say to him, how is it that you're allowed to heal this person on the Sabbath day? That's the story. And it says, it says that Moses says to you to, to circumcise your children. Right, and and you're even allowed to circumcise a boy uh, on the Sabbath. So now we'll go into chapter seven, verse twenty-three in John. He says, "If and I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but if if a boy is able to be circumcised on Sabbath, which only affects a small limb of his body, how much more so could you heal an entire body?" Now, if you ask any Christian, what, what is this? What are these talking? What are these talking points? What is he talking about? Why? Forget about why it would anyone object to Jesus healing on Sabbath. We'll just. Well, I want to put that aside for a moment. But what is he talking about? If you can circumcise a boy on the Sabbath. So then you could, sh and then you're affecting only one limb, then you surely can heal the whole person. Now that is using a, a form of logic called a kalvachomer, which means from an, a light case you can prove a heavier case. If it is forbidden to operate a motor vehicle in the state of Texas with a blood alcohol level of 0 0.01, then it's certainly forbidden to operate a motor vehicle with an alcohol level of 0 0.02. And you definitely can't operate a motor vehicle if you're on heroin. You know, so from a lighter case, you can do the strong case. So he says, if you're allowed to circumcise a child on the Shabbos, which ordinarily would be forbidden, but you were allowed to do that, you certainly can heal the whole person. Well, what prohibition is he talking about? Now, if you know the oral Torah, if you're familiar with the Talmud, if you're familiar, then you'll know, then you read Tractate Shabbos, uh, um, uh, Daf Ayin Zayin, Omen Aleph, and Daf Kuf Hei, Omen Aleph, and Kuf Vav, Omen 105, 106, 107, all straight through. This is discussed extensively, and that is that really one ordinarily on Shabbos is not allowed to perform, is not allowed to create an incision in the body, a blood-letting wound. It's forbidden on Shabbos. You wouldn't know that from the written Torah, but you would know that from the oral Torah. However, the oral Torah tells us that for circumcision, let's say a boy is born on Shabbos, baby boy is born on Shabbos, so you have to circumcise him on the eighth day. When would the eighth day come out if a boy is born on Shabbos? The following Shabbos, that's the eighth day. That's eight days later. So are you allowed to perform a circumcision on Shabbos? Because if you perform a circumcision on Shabbos, you're performing an act that should be forbidden according to the oral law. Written law, you would never know it. So the answer is the oral law provides a special dispensation that you're allowed to be 
you're allowed to circumcise a child. In fact, you must circumcise a child if it's the eighth day on Shabbos. That's only a law. So therefore, the whole conversation, the whole basis of that conversation is now from the oral Torah, we can now understand the book of John. I know for many Jews watching this, they're going, what? What? You know, but as it turns out, you only can understand the oral law. You can go and really go to your, if you're a Christian, go to your pastor. If you're not a Christian, I don't recommend it. But if you're a Christian, please ask the pastor, explain this to me. He will have no idea. He'll say, I have to look it up. And you'd have to go into some really good commentary on Matthew in order to, for someone to explain to you what's going on here. That it, so therefore, now we understand what John is doing. John knows, I mean, we don't know who wrote the book of John. The book of John was written, it's an anonymous book. But whoever wrote it was a highly literate, well-trained, Greek-speaking uh, Christian who lived at the end of the first century, who was completely familiar with the oral Torah. I mean, because this is, was the only normative Judaism. There was Sadducees. They were, they were considered off the wall. They were considered like, I don't know, you know, some just group that was completely heretical. Everyone knew that oral Torah, normative Judaism was oral Torah. So therefore, he shapes and contours this story using the oral Torah. And now we understand John in that what John has Jesus saying is, if just like circumcision, which is ordinarily would be a prohibited act on Shabbos. Why? Because the oral Torah would not allow to perform a bloodletting wound on Shabbos. But there's a special dispensation that for circumcision you are you do perform as, you do perform that on the Sabbath day. There's a special dispensation in the oral Torah. So therefore John's Jesus using this as an example is going if you can form a circumcision which heals only one part of one limb, a small limb of a baby, then you surely can heal the whole person. Now, therefore, we see openly that the oral Torah is in the Christian It's It's all over the Christian Bible. You, you, what is a Sabbath day journey in the beginning of the book of Acts? I'll give you a hundred examples. You, you talked about phylacteries. The Torah doesn't tell us. Phylacteries is actually a Greek term. The Torah just says, you know, in a number of places that you should bind this on your arm. And but what do you bind? What do you put there? How do you... Torah doesn't tell us how to do it. But we actually find phylacteries mentioned... Um, uh, actually, the, fir I, the first time, I think, in literature that we find phylacteries mentioned is in, in the Christian Bible. And that's in examples in Matthew 23. As it turns out, we did find in Cave 4 of Qumran... 24 phylacteries. And those phylacteries are 2,200 years old. That means they, they predate Christianity by a couple of centuries. And they're identical to the phylacteries that we have today. Identical with every stitch. And you can um, go online and you can uh, view the phylacteries. Because how do you know what, what is a phylactery? The Torah does, just says, put it on your head and your arm. But what are you supposed to put there? As it turns out, there are four portions of the Torah that you put there. Uh, um, two of them are from Exodus and two of them are from Deuteronomy. You have Exodus 13, uh, uh, 13 verse 9 and verse 16 and then you have Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 8 and Deuteronomy chapter 11 verse 18. How do you know that? Well as it turns out they found in Qumran which predates Christianity phylacteries that are exactly precisely according to the oral Torah. That predates Christianity. Incidentally when I say there's no, the when I say there is no other, there certainly was other literature describing this, but there is very, liter very little literature or artifacts of the ancient world that survived, and certainly something as delicate as written literature. What's very important is that in the Dead Sea area is a desert. It means there's almost no humidity there, and therefore it is an ideal environment where things would survive. There are 
in, in Jerusalem, where there's, even though Jerusalem is not a humid place, but you take coastal towns where there's Ashdod, Ashkelon, and so on, or Haifa, that whole coastal area, that's an area where documents would not survive. Why? Because there's so much humidity that it would cause a document to degrade. So we have very little that survives. So the Dead Sea, all this whole treasure trove of ancient material that has survived, that's in our hands today, and because a young man named Mohammed Adib in 1947, a Bedouin boy, threw a stone into a cave and heard the crash and takes off from there. So it was preserved in the Dead Sea because it's an arid area, which is an ideal environment to preserve it. So we see that these films survive it. So therefore, throughout the Christian Bible, we see the oral law is everywhere. Not only is oral law there, but even rabbinic injunctions that protect the Torah. I can go find in chapter one. I, I should mention that if the Torah was oral, we know now that the, that the oral law has been recorded. What, when did it go from oral to a written body? So in the, in the, about the year 200, uh, it, the Jews were being persecuted. There was a great fear that all this would be destroyed and all this would be lost. So a great rabbi, Rabbi Huda Hanasi, his name is Rabbi, he was, a, he, I mean, he was known affectionately as our teacher, it was decided to put it in writing because if it wouldn't wasn't put in writing, it could have been lost. We lost thousands of proverbs of King Solomon. We know that from the Bible, and they didn't want that to happen to the Oral Torah, and therefore it was put into writing. So therefore, as it turns out, the Christian Bible is has in it the Oral Torah word for word, word for word in many instances that you will find in the Mishnah and in the Talmud that were put into writing two, three, four, five hundred years later. That's the key point.